Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a video and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful people from around the world. Today, I am delighted to welcome a very, very senior professional who spent time in multiple industries, Sandeep Sethi, to our show. Sandeep, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ashutosh. Thanks for the invite. Thank you. Sandeep is currently the Managing Director, Corporate Solutions, West Asia for JLL. He has spent time in telecom in Africa. He spent time with Carrier in China. He was with Johnson Controls in USA and Singapore. And he is an MS and MBA from the US. So Sandeep, to start with, what would you say are three key milestones in your career? <laughs> Oh, that's a, that's a good question, Ashutosh. I, I think the first one was when I left India. I uh, completed my graduation from Pune University and I left for the US to study further. Mm-hmm. It was interesting when I graduated with an engineering degree, I thought by the end of it, I'd be MacGyver. I'd be able to break open things and fix them and create inventions with my engineering skills. Mm-hmm. It was none of that. It was very theoretical knowledge. So I wanted to study further. And uh, being born and brought up in a small town, uh, Pune, or Pune it was then, I had a very sheltered life. Mm -hmm. And leaving home, leaving the country, and going abroad, and this was uh, in the early 90s, when India was very different from what it is today. Correct. It was certainly a very uh, different experience for me. It was the right thing to do for me. And uh, I was amazed with how much I learned in just a very short period. Mm-hmm. I think that was certainly a great turning point in my life. And uh, as I went through the journey of life, I realized uh, uh, there was much more to it than what I was exposed to. So I, uh, I found myself becoming a very open personality. Okay. And I traveled a lot, explored a lot, and I changed industries. And I felt every time I changed industries from a career perspective, uh, it opened my eyes <clears throat> to a completely new world of possibilities. Mm-hmm. And that whole learning process was just uh, just fantastic. Coming back to Asia was also a turning point. Mm. <clears throat> Sorry, I, I lived in the US for about 10, 11 years, and I realized that what inspired me or what I really wanted to do in life, I had a lot more opportunities in Asia to mm-hmm. fulfill those ambitions or those aspirations. And I came back and I felt that was... Uh, that was uh, turning point in my life as well, okay. from a personal perspective, from a spiritual perspective, and of course, from a career perspective as well. Okay. And I would say, uh, you know, th- th- it's a long list of many of the uh, events that sort of uh, took me on paths that I hadn't imagined. Mm-hmm. And every, uh, each time I learned something new about myself, but it also helped me build a better future in terms of how I wanted my life to pan out. Fantastic. But I would say these two, uh, these two, shape my career and my personal lives uh, quite intensely. Fantastic. So before I start asking some questions on JLL, tell me, you know, you're one of the few people I've seen who's moved across multiple industries, you know, from telecom to uh, air conditioning and equipment there, to carrier to Johnson Controls. You've lived across multiple countries. What was your experience in shortening your learning curve each time? And now, of course, real estate. Yeah, you know, I didn't want to be a man of one season. So Mm -hmm. I very consciously made a decision to change my uh, industries. Mm -hmm. And I always look for a few things before I made these changes. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be part of an industry uh, that was trying to solve real world challenges. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be part of an industry that had the opportunity to make a social impact. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be part of an industry that was a growth industry. Mm -hmm. So when I moved to, so for example, I started my career with uh, smart building or uh, building automation systems mm-hmm. industry when I worked for Johnson Controls. I moved to the, the, the food refrigeration industry. Then I moved to telecom infrastructure and then now real estate. Mm-hmm. When I joined Carrier uh, in the food refrigeration business, I was inspired by the opportunity to uh, address the cold chain opportunity that existed in India, Africa, and other emerging markets. Sure. Uh, when I joined the telecom infrastructure, again, it was the opportunity to uh, connect millions of people and that to uh, in emerging markets outside mm-hmm. of India. I sort of went through a process each time I uh, 
jump to a different industry. Mm-hmm. Before I got into it, I read a lot about the industry. Okay. I spoke to a lot of people. I tried to uh, understand what were the critical insights of the industry. I tried to understand what could be the two, three levers that one could engage in the industry to really move the needle. And uh, after I joined the industry, the first year typically I found to be the most intense. I saw myself traveling a lot. I saw myself taking a lot of notes, asking a lot of questions, talking to stakeholders outside of the business as well, uh, listening to interviews of uh, peer group uh, leaders. And my objective always was to try and understand what was noise and what was real within the first 12 months or so. You know, once you get to that point, then life becomes easier because then you can narrow your focus down to three or four things that you need to work on Mm. uh, that will truly make a difference. And everything else, for the most part, is noise. And then I work backwards in terms of ensuring I have a lifestyle that allows me to work on those three four things Mm. that matter. Very interesting. So, Singh, let's talk about JLL. I think you've been here for almost 10 years, isn't it? Seven and a half. Seven and a half years. Okay. So, you know, you're the Managing Director for Corporate Solutions, West Asia. Tell me about the scope of work that you do. Right. So, broadly speaking, we serve three stakeholders, Mm -hmm. Ashutosh. Mm -hmm. Investors, developers, and corporates. Corporates are occupiers. Mm -hmm. They're occupiers of office buildings or industrial plants, data centers, warehouses, etc. And um, an occupier would have requirements uh, related to real estate during the entire life cycle of the real estate Mm -hmm. asset. So think of a large company that wants to move to India and they want to set up shop somewhere. So they would engage a professional organization like ours Mm -hmm. uh, to help them understand what would be a good location. So we help them as a strategic consultant at that stage. Mm -hmm. We could help get them land or we could help get them space that we would then develop for them. Okay. Uh, we have a construction management business that would build the space for them mm-hmm. in terms of the base build or the fit outs for the interiors. Mm-hmm. Once that would be built, we would then manage the space for them. What mm-hmm. that means is we would take away everything that would be related to workplace services, could mm-hmm. be uh, engineering services for the buildings, could be soft services. We could manage the cafeteria, their employee mm-hmm. commute, okay. could manage anything that's mm-hmm. non-core to them. Understand. And of course, then we'd stay connected with them and help them make the workplace more efficient. We mm-hmm. could manage the leases. We do a lot of sustainability work for our clients. As you know, buildings are, buildings consume 40% or they're responsible for 40% of the emissions mm-hmm. from, a, from a sustainability perspective. So there's a lot we do and can do for real estate. Okay. Uh, corporate Solutions is a business unit that addresses all the products we sell to corporate clients and I look after that business for West Asia, which is predominantly India and a few neighboring countries. And it's a pretty large business. We're probably one of the largest businesses for JLL outside of North America. Wow. So tell me, you know, traditionally in in South Asia, real estate has been, you know, done by small individual uh, entrepreneurs. Hmm. How has the entry of large organizations like JLL started to make a change? It's a good question. And it's very different today, indeed, compared to years ago. It's very different today compared to even five, six years ago. Mm. You know, the World Bank publishes uh, some ratings or rankings every year. One of them is ease of doing business. Mm. And thanks to various reforms and initiatives on uh, that the government has launched in the last five to 10 years, mm. uh, we've seen India move several notches up. I think it was 140 something in terms of ease of doing business six years ago. Mm-hmm. And today or end of last year, we were at uh, 60 something. In terms of ease of obtaining construction permits, we've gone from 180 something to mm-hmm. 20 something. Mm-hmm. And obviously, these are not just coincidences. They're a result of the reforms and initiatives. So we've got a lot of new acts that the government has passed. Uh, I'm referring to, for example, RERA. Mm-hmm. I'm referring to, for example, the uh, Benami Transaction Prohibition right. Amendment Act. I'm referring to GST, mm-hmm. uh, the digitization of land records, for example. Mm-hmm. All these things have instilled a high sense of confidence mm-hmm. uh, in, with the investor community. Mm-hmm. And obviously, uh, the transparency has helped India bring in a lot of foreign capital. Mm-hmm. So you can see the th- 
three largest developers or landlords in the country today are not the usual suspects you would expect. Right. There are companies like Blackstone, Brookfield, and and Capital Land used wow. to be called the centers. Mm. Uh, you can see the success of REITs. You know, REITs didn't exist in India till uh, more than a year and a half ago. Yeah. We've had two successful launches. The first mm. one was oversubscribed to almost two and a half times. Yeah. And uh, these things are obviously the right things to happen for a country like ours. Mm. Because as you get institutional uh, investors, as you get organized players to come in, mm. the quality of assets improve as well. Correct. And uh, that improves the overall experience. You can mm. see good quality shopping malls in India. You can see mm. good quality office buildings. You go to some of the office buildings, you feel you're walking into a five-star facility. Correct. And, you know, there's a direct connect between the workplace environment mm. and the engagement levels of employees at work as well. Mm. And there are enough uh, studies that validate that. So employees feel good going to work. Employers feel good about Lease, signing up leases in good quality office uh, mm -hmm. assets. Mm -hmm. to, to build on that point, further, I can give you another example. In the last five years or so, India saw about $6 billion of uh, institutional funds coming in from outside into real estate. Okay. In 2020 alone, in spite of this being one of the most difficult years ever, mm -hmm. we've seen about $3 billion coming in so Amazing. far. Amazing. So this is a journey that it's just going to keep going in the right direction. And it's great for the country. It's great for our sector Fantastic. as well. So tell me, you know, when you, uh, as someone who runs corporate solutions, do these organizations also look for residential for all their employees? We don't, we don't look for residential, don't. obviously for our own employees. We look yeah. for, I mean, we have a residential business unit okay. that uh, works with corporates, that works in the open market as well. Mm -hmm. And we provide residential services, be it buying and selling of uh, real estate, mm -hmm. uh, residential real estate, or it could be leasing as well. So it's uh, it's certainly a part of our big part of a business. Wonderful. And residential has proven to be a very resilient asset class. Okay. You know, there's a myth that the younger generation does not want to buy mm -hmm. residential uh, assets. And I say it's a myth because it's not that they don't want to buy residential, mm -hmm. but what they really care about is work-life balance, Correct. experience, mm -hmm. safety, commute time. Mm -hmm. Now, when you think of all that, it just doesn't make sense, doesn't make sense for a young person today to mm -hmm. buy a residential piece of property far away Correct. Uh, from the offices, which are typically in central business districts mm -hmm. or city centers. Because if you buy them far away, yes, of course, they are more affordable, mm -hmm. but then uh, it kills the other drivers they have, Absolutely. commute, work-life balance, etc. And hence, they don't end up buying uh, mm -hmm. residential. Mm -hmm. But what's happened in this 2020 is that the world has been convinced that you can work from anywhere. Correct. Right. And in the future, we're going to see more companies offer that flexibility to employees. Mm -hmm. They'll allow them to work from uh, either remote locations or satellite towns, et cetera, mm -hmm. which means the young kids will now be, be fine with buying residential mm -hmm. because of the reasons I just mentioned. Correct. And of course, you, you add to that other things that are happening from the supply side. Mm -hmm. Interest rates are very low. Mm -hmm. You've got deferred payment options. Mm -hmm. You've got prices that are very attractive. You put everything together. Residential certainly has become very attractive, not just to you know, not just to uh, people in the thirties and forties, but to a large extent, even to the people in the twenties. Hmm. And we've seen residential demand just going up in the last three months, uh, more Amazing. than ever before. Amazing. So tell me, you know, how is the global economy now beginning to impact real estate in India? This year uh, has been. Uh, Obviously, a difficult you know, year. sounds a very difficult year. It sounds cliched when I say unprecedented, but it certainly has impacted real estate in many ways. Mm. It's uh, made it difficult for certain asset classes, but it's opened up other avenues. Correct. So net net, it'll probably be uh, uh, net positive for the real estate sector. Okay. Now you look at what's happening in the commercial office sector. Mm. As I said earlier, earlier, many companies or many employers will give their employees an opportunity to work from anywhere, mm. depending on the role, of course, mm -hmm. which means they may not need large offices 
to the extent they required in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, they might allow 20% of their employees to work from remote locations all the time, which means right. they might put a hold on their expansion plans. So mm -hmm. certainly that's a dent on the commercial office space. Okay. However, there are some companies that feel otherwise. They feel even if the vaccine comes up, they'll have to instill a sense of safety and uh, discipline in their workplaces for mm. good, mm. which means they'll introduce social distancing measures, they'll de-densify the offices, and they might say uh, they need more space than ever before. Mm. But regardless of which way the companies go, there is going to be an impact on commercial office space. Sure. Now, what that does is it opens up the demand for residential, as we just discussed. Mm -hmm. Likewise, you look at shopping malls. I don't think shopping malls will bounce back in the next three to four months. Eventually they will, but it's going to take a beating for a while mm -hmm. because most people will feel comfortable ordering online. Right. Now, what that does is it opens up the demand for more uh, warehouses mm -hmm. for logistic companies. It opens up the demand for more data centers mm -hmm. because there's going to be a lot more online transactions or e-commerce going to happen. Mm -hmm. So clearly... A bit of a hit for certain sectors, a lot more opportunities for new sectors. And that's where the money is going. That's where we see a uh, lot more opportunities for us as a business as well. So we're creating strategic priorities around tapping into those opportunities. Fantastic. So Sandeep, you know, coming back to your own business, uh, you know, of uh, dealing with global companies and bringing them to India, what are some of the values that you and your organization stand for, especially in view of the fact that you work with global clients? Sure, um, Ashutosh, it's a great question. And values uh, are obviously what many of our clients look for when mm -hmm. they sign up with uh, companies like us Correct. Uh, for the right reasons. Uh, you know, JLL, for example, we're driven by three core values around teamwork, ethics, mm -hmm. and excellence. Correct. And you know, it's important that every person in the corporate world, or forget corporate world, every person, regardless of where, mm -hmm. uh, should be influenced by core values. Okay. And, uh, you know, when you talk of integrity, that's absolutely a core value that everyone across every sector, every part of the world expects. Now, in the, it, integrity is manifested in different ways. It mm -hmm. could mean ethics. It could mean uh, being fair. It could mean, uh, you know, delivering on what you commit. Mm. Uh, that's, I think it's a condition of engagement from a business perspective. If you don't have a partner that's high on integrity, you know, it's, it's a no brainer that deal's not going to happen. Mm. Mm. So that is absolutely very important in the real estate world as well. Right. And that goes back to the question you asked earlier, you know, because of everything that's happened in the country, it's, it's, it's easy to find partners mm. in real estate uh, that will deliver on their commitments uh, today than, say, five to seven years ago. Mm. The other core value that's turning out to be very important, uh, not just for business stakeholders, but also for employees as they look for employees to work with, is, is this whole thing around finding a sense of purpose. Correct. Now, we used to think that only millennial, millennials look for a sense of purpose. That's mm. not true. I think mm. all of us look for Correct. a sense of purpose. Correct. I'm driven by, uh, I like going to work for the company I work for right now because I like what it stands for. I like mm. what it's trying to do. And, you know, we have a purpose statement at JLL. Mm. It says, you want to shape the future of real estate for a better world. Correct. And it's not just a statement. We've had so many discussions and uh, deliberations on how we can actually execute on that mm -hmm. and we have a we have a sense of clarity in terms of what we can do to build a better world using real estate as a as a lever mm -hmm. so I, I think it's integrity it's finding that sense of purpose these two things are becoming extremely important when we try and pitch for new business with the clients it's amazing the kind of questions they ask us mm -hmm. today they want to know of course a lot more about our ethics policies how we treat fairness our views on social justice, mm -hmm. what we're doing to make a social impact, mm -hmm. our, our policies and initiatives around sustainability, diversity, inclusion, CSR. These things were, you know, they were not discussed too much in business many years right. back, but now it's how decisions are made in terms of who you want to work with. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So Sandeep, let me now move to the second part of our conversation, which are some questions for you personally. For, um, for someone who has, you know, 
traveled the world, lived all over, worked with some of the biggest companies, continuing to do a great work. What does success mean to Sandeep? Well, success clearly is about delivering results. Okay. Uh, but to me, it's not just the destination. Mm -hmm. It's the journey that matters as well. Mm -hmm. I'm very fond of high altitude trekking and climbing. Mm -hmm. And uh, this year, in fact, I was scheduled to go to uh, Lakpari. It's a 23,000 tall wow. peak mm -hmm. in Tibet. Uh, corona came along and uh, changed my plans. But the point I'm trying to make is mm -hmm. uh, every time I go on a trek or a climb, of course, there's there's a peak that we're trying to summit, and okay. that's the destination. But the journey is a lot more exciting than the moment, uh, than the, than the than just reaching the peak. Okay. Uh, the journey is very spiritual. It's mm -hmm. it's it's a great experience, mm -hmm. and I feel uh, so close to nature and to myself mm -hmm. when I'm going through the journey. Wow. Of course, when you reach the summit, you give high fives, you take some photographs, you mm -hmm. feel good, but you know, you also feel sad that it's over. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's how it should be. When you're, you know, I, I, for example, I always have targets. Of course, I have targets in my professional world. Mm -hmm. It's it's a given. But I, I make a lot of targets every year in my personal life as well. Mm -hmm. Targets could be around my finances, mm -hmm. around my health, or could be family. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my objective is not try and boil the ocean and have too many targets. Mm -hmm. I, I said, you know, three, four meaningful targets that really mattered to the business or the personal front at that point mm -hmm. in time. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm pretty good at executing what I uh, commit to, mm -hmm. which means, uh, you know, I track everything like a program. I have, uh, I check on my performance at the business front and of course, personal front as well mm -hmm. at regular milestones. Mm -hmm. I, I celebrate, uh, uh, regularly, so if I if I have to achieve uh, something uh, on the health front, let's mm -hmm. say, and I keep doing monthly checks, and if I'm going the right direction, I, I feel good about it. I mm -hmm. uh, I celebrate with the family, mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately, you know, I feel if you enjoy the journey, mm -hmm. then even if God forbid you don't make it to the destination, mm -hmm. at least you don't have regrets. But I've seen people who get so stressed over the destination that they just they, they forget to enjoy the journey. That right. becomes very stressful. Mm. And uh, so I, uh, I consciously made a change in my life many years ago to enjoy the journey more than the destination. The destination is a given. You will enjoy it, of course, but you've got to enjoy the journey more. Fantastic. So, Sandeep, now I'm to my last question. And you know, I was debating what to ask you. But I think, you know, given all the successes you've had as a professional manager, my question to you is, what would your advice be to young managers? And thousands of people will watch our conversation and will listen to you speaking. What would your advice be to a young manager starting off on their journey in life? I would say, Ashutosh, in the new world, learning is going to be very, very important. Okay. And the more you learn, the more you realize there's so much more to learn. So you just can't stop learning. But one aspect of learning is also to unlearn. Mm -hmm. Now, the new world may require us to approach things differently. Mm -hmm. So you've got to learn what to uh, build on. You've got to learn what to give up as well. Mm -hmm. And that comes with just being aware and conscious. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, my advice to young folks would be to keep learning. Okay. Uh, the other advice would be to think of yourself as a creator and not just an operator. Okay. Because again, in the new world, there will be many uh, opportunities that we haven't come across yet. Mm -hmm. Customers will have unarticulated needs. So it's important to really get close to your stakeholders, try mm -hmm. and understand what real life challenges could exist in the new world and create solutions. I think there'll be enough opportunities to create solutions rather than just be an operator. Mm -hmm. And those that those 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 people who who find themselves uh, equipped to creating solutions mm -hmm. with the right skill sets uh, they will see a lot lot of growth opportunities going forward and lastly i would say uh, you know be true to yourself live by your core values your lifestyle should be influenced by your core values mm -hmm. uh, that's absolutely important and that's uh, that's always been important but it's going to be more and more important going forward fantastic 
Sandeep, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure speaking to you. Let me first start by wishing that you've not already climbed the 25, 23,000 feet, but the 29,000 feet peak as well. Uh, and lots of success in everything else that you're doing at work. Thank you so much, Ashutosh, for having me. And a big congratulations to you as well for what you achieved with your platform. It's very Thank inspiring you. indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to The Brand Called You videocast and podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.